Hello. On April 12, 1865, the American Civil War came to an end when the Union Army officially accepted the unconditional surrender of the Confederacy at the steps of a courthouse in Appomattox, Virginia. The Union Army, led by 200,000 black soldiers, destroyed the institution of slavery, and as a result of their victory, black people were no longer property, but were now to be citizens of the United States. The Civil Rights Act of 1866, the first declaration of civil rights in the United States, read in part, quote, citizens of every race and color, without regard to any previous condition of slavery or involuntary servitude, shall have the same right in every state and territory in the United States to full and equal benefit of the laws and proceedings for the security of person and property as is enjoyed by white citizens. 150 years later to the day, on April 12, 2015, 217 miles north of the Appomattox Courthouse, where the Civil War finally came to an end, Freddie Gray, a 25-year-old black man, was chased by Baltimore police. His crime? Making eye contact with the police and running away. At 9 a.m., Freddie Gray was caught by police and loaded into a van. By the time he emerged from the van 45 minutes later, 80% of his spinal cord had been severed, his neck almost snapped in half. Now, I know that people in Baltimore know the story of Freddie Gray better than I do, but I think that his death and the subsequent hung jury in the first trial regarding his death symbolize the continued racial inequality experienced by most black people in this country. In other words, the span of time from the end of the Civil War and the inception of rights of black citizenship to the state-sanctioned beating and torture of Freddie Gray symbolizes the very real difference between formal equality before the law and the self-determination and self-possession that is inherent in actual freedom. The right to be free from oppression, the right to make determinations about your life free from duress, coercion, or threat of harm. 150 years after emancipation, the country still requires a movement that makes the most basic of claims, that black lives matter. The question must be asked then, whether or not the United States is actually capable of transforming the platitudes of freedom into actual rights for whom access is not determined by race or class status. On at least some level, we have to consider that if our government were actually interested in freedom for the vast majority of black people, it would exist. But the promise of freedom assumes that it actually existed in the United States in the first place. In fact, black people were not freed into a just society. Black people were not freed into an American dream. We were freed into what Malcolm X described as an American nightmare. Far from being the land of the free, we live in a land of savage inequalities, where 400 billionaires live alongside 45 million poor people. Since 2007, 10 million people have been displaced from their homes by the foreclosure crisis. 46 million people live on food stamps. The list of inequities could continue, but the point is plain that black people were not freed into a country of unfettered opportunity. And it's the economic inequality at the heart of American capitalism that is often obscured by racial inequality. Because when black people are 27% of the 45 million poor people in the US, we are told it's because of black culture. It is because black people are lazy. And this prompts us to interrogate interrogate the morality of black people and not a system that produces 45 million poor people in the first place. This stereotyping of African Americans is not, however, only about poverty. 
It shapes all of the public perceptions of black people. And so not only do these racist characterizations hide the systemic nature of black inequality, but they also contribute to an atmosphere that regards black people as a menace, as criminals, and generally as a problem population that must be patrolled and policed. The police as an institution have fully absorbed these stereotypes of, and racism as it pertains to African Americans. There really is no other way to understand the casual disregard for black life in the hands of the police. Consider how Michael Slager, Officer Michael Slaver, Slager in South Carolina took aim as, he were, as if he were doing target practice when he shot a fleeing Walter Scott eight times in the back. Recall how 12-year-old Tamir Rice was shot within 1.6 seconds of the police arriving on the scene, but more importantly, remember how he lay dying unattended as two police officers stood passively by, refusing to help him. A handful of these cases have become well known to people across the country, but they cannot convey the daily terror, brutality, and humiliation at the hands of the police that course through black communities across this country. All of this has contributed to the eruption of the Black Lives Matter movement. And it is the movement that has exposed to the world what black America has always known. The police are not intended to preserve law and order. They are agents of lawlessness and disorder. They are not out of control. Instead, they have been unleashed in poor and working class black communities. And for those of you who think I'm exaggerating, consider this. Over the last decade, the city of Chicago has paid more than $500 million to settle police brutality lawsuits. In 10 years, New York City has paid on average $100 million a year to settle police brutality and misconduct cases. Police murder and violence are simply the cost of doing business in cities across the country. Because any other public institution, including hospitals, clinics, libraries, schools, responsible for that kind of debt and misconduct would have their budgets cut and their employees fired. When the Chicago public schools were facing a billion dollar deficit in 2013, Mayor Rahm Emanuel closed 52 public schools, but no one dare suggest closing police precincts because they are too costly. And these issues are related, because when you close schools and you close hospitals and libraries, when you provide no jobs, when you keep people in segregated, substandard, lead-infested housing, you are creating the conditions that justify the presence of the police. You are not transforming those conditions that create crime in the first place. And when the most powerful country in the world cannot reign in its police, it is not because they cannot, it is because they will not. In 2015, American police last year killed 1,134 people. Young black men were nine times more likely to be killed by police than other Americans. But these numbers are just the tip of the iceberg. According to the findings of a study conducted by the Bureau of Justice Statistics on police homicides, in the years 2003 to 2009 and 2011, American police killed 7,427 people. That's an average of 928 people a year. And if you add that average up, for 2010, 2012, 2013, and 2014, we are talking about over 11,000 people killed by the police in the last 11 years. A disproportionate number of them black and brown. Consider that in 2014, 58 American soldiers were killed in Iraq, or that 78 people were killed by law enforcement in Canada in 2014, 
or that from 2010 to 2014, in police in England killed four people. In Germany, the police killed no one in 2013 and 2014. In China, with a population four and a half times the size of the United States, the police killed 12 people in 2014. So there has never been a golden age of good policing in the United States that we can point to where the police were killing on average that number of people or not killing one at all. Because the police have always reflected the racism, inequality, and brutality that exists in this country. And it's happening at a time of unprecedented black political power. We have more black elected officials in Congress, state houses, and local government than in any other time in this country's history. The president is black. The nation's top law enforcement officer is black. And this was the fulfillment of a strategy at the end of the 1960s that called for black control of black communities. That we should have our own politicians, our own elected officials. Well, it's been almost 50 years, and I think that we can say that that strategy has failed. Because when a black mayor of Baltimore calls for the National Guard, a unit that is led by a black woman, to put down a rebellion of black youngsters and black millennials, then we have come to the end of one phase of the black movement, and we are entering into another. Many like to compare the movement of today with the civil rights movement of the 1960s. But the Baltimore Rebellion of last April conjured up memories, for me at least, of the rebellions of the 1960s. Because African Americans then, like today, were not fighting, at the end of the 60s, were not fighting Jim Crow or legal discrimination, but they were struggling against the injustice of poverty, unemployment, substandard housing, and police brutality none of which was against the law, but all of which was at the root of black hardship. And so whether you agree or do not agree with the uprising is not important. What is important is what the rebellion communicated about justice, freedom, and equality in our country. But I ask you to consider the rebellion also in the way that Martin Luther King Jr. did in the 1960s. And as we prepare to celebrate his birthday on Monday, I want to end with a quote from him that was, that was from an article he wrote in the aftermath of a Detroit uprising in 1967 that was much more, it was much bigger and much more destructive than what happened in Baltimore. And here's what King said, the other King that we often don't hear from. But this is what he said, quote, I am not sad that black Americans are rebelling. This was not only inevitable, but imminently desirable. Without this magnificent ferment among Negroes, the old evasions and procrastinations would have continued indefinitely. Black people have slammed the door shut on a past of deadening passivity. Except for the Reconstruction years, they have never in their long history on American soil struggled with such creativity and courage for their freedom. These are our bright years of emergence. Though they are painful ones, they cannot be avoided. In these trying circumstances, the black revolution is much more than a struggle for the rights of Negroes. It is forcing America to face all of its interrelated flaws. Racism, poverty, militarism, and materialism. It is exposing the evils that are rooted deeply in the whole structure of our society. It reveals systemic rather than superficial flaws and suggests that radical reconstruction of society itself is the real issue to be faced. Today's dissenters tell the complacent majority that the time has come when further evasion of social responsibility in a turbulent world will court disaster and death. America has not changed yet, has, has not yet changed, because so many people think it need not change. But this is the illusion of the damned. America must change, because 23 million black citizens will no longer live supinely in a wretched past. They have left the valley of despair. 
They have found strength in struggle. Joined by white allies, they will shake the, wall, the prison walls until they fall. America must change. Thank you.